All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of Minecraft and More, the End Symposium. So, well, we had a wonderful presentation uh, that's going to be very hard for us to follow up from the Mario Craft kids and Marianne yeah. and Braun. Uh, you guys did a wonderful job. So, uh, really quickly, again, uh, thanking to our organizers who helped organize this event. So, the Games MOOC, Visti, SIGBE, the RG MOOC, and Inevitable Betrayal. Uh, thank you all for your help. Also, we have a wonderful group of collaborators. Uh, they're all here. Uh, you can see here uh, Sig, Sig ML, uh, Massively at Joy K. Uh, we have the Techie Owl, so thank you very much. And we also have Minecraft in Schools, and we actually have uh, one representative here in this, in this panel. Uh, also, for those of you looking at social media, uh, go ahead and use the hashtag GameMook. And uh, also, uh, actually, the playing Morrow was from the Morrowcraft one there. So uh, that one, if you follow that, you'll probably still catch some of the late chatter. But if you're following the game mooc hashtag, you'll catch uh, those of us that are, are going to be tweeting uh, this panel as well. And also, there'll be a YouTube channel as well, and uh, I actually will be uh, having fun moderating that as well. And uh, so you'll be able to ask your questions there. So also, special thanks to everyone listed here uh, for all the help and input that you guys are doing. Uh, we could not have done it without you. And without further ado, on to Minecraft science and STEM, because you have to talk about STEM when it comes to Minecraft and games. So with us tonight, we have uh, Dr. Farah Banani, and uh, she is the online chair for math and science. Uh, she's also biology faculty at Front Range Community College. Uh, she's also doing a project as the project leader for Project Outbreak, uh, which is an immersive game-based learning faculty challenge grant recipient. Uh, we also have Lucas Gillespie, the Instructional and Technology Coordinator for Pender County Schools, uh, and also mastermind of a lot of other things out there. So he cackled evilly, evilly in the background. <laughs> 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 and lastly, you guys have to put up with me some more. So uh, my name is Chris Lukes. I'm the Associate Dean for Career and Technical Education. I'm also project lead on the uh, CCCS Hackathon grant. Uh, which is also part of that Immersive Faculty Challenge grant uh, from the Colorado Community College system. Uh, and so uh, one of the things we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk about um, some of the different ways we're looking at games, and it's really Minecraft as well as some others, and how that addresses STEM. So uh, first, why don't we start off with Farah, and uh, if you talk a little bit about your uh, project outbreak, and it, it is an immersive learning game, but you talk about what you looked at as far as uh, bringing science and using games for science. Thank you. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, well, basically, uh, the project outbreak uh, in microbiology, so rather than uh, just teaching and lecturing, so we come up with the idea of writing this grant, and we're using augmented reality uh, for that, uh, trying to make it epistemic, and uh, Chris is one of the members in the advisory committee, so thank you for working with us <laughs> on this one. And uh, the students loved it because basically we give them scenarios and cases and we tag, we're using um, the web tag, the tag web um, app and we're using specific area uh, in the campus and I take them there, Kay always uh, is with us, working with us as well on this uh, project and we assign for them different cases and we give them clue and basically the idea is uh, from this unknown information that they got from videos, we give them sometimes misleading information, trying to mimic exactly what happened in real life situation. Uh, sometimes you give them incomplete uh, information and within two, three weeks, uh, their job is kind of to find out through all of those updated information that we give them throughout the, uh, the following weeks, uh, trying to narrow it down and finally diagnose properly what this patient has and uh, so so far it has been fun. Uh, we have been doing it since 2012 so this semester is the third semester so uh, over 180 students basically have participated so far in this project. So yeah, awesome. uh, final exam is on Monday so I hope you posted what the grade will be. <laughs> 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 and everyone's waiting with bated breath for their grade, so that's, that's normal. Uh, yes. yeah. <laughs> and, and of course, you've also been researching Minecraft for STEM, correct? Absolutely. Uh, uh, Minecraft has been used a lot. I mean, in, in all fairness, Australia has been using it uh, ahead of uh, the U.S. And there are different uh, subjects, as you know, where we can use um, Minecraft and the strongest thing I would say it's more in teaching ecology because uh, 
the biggest advantage from the way how Minecraft is designed, so basically you can talk about biome, you can have students design them, uh, they can do a lot of things in terms of uh, ecology. Now in biology, uh, if I have to choose the human body, it uh, would be fun to have maps and uh, Kay probably would make fun uh, of this and she would like it probably, but think of uh, your friend is sick and your job is to go inside, think of almost like the movie Fantastic voyage, it's the same thing. So you go inside, you're trying to dig to find out basically what is the condition, what is the problem. So you may fight microbe. In this case, you have to uh, study the immune system, or maybe there's problem with the metabolism. So those are different ways, and uh, throughout this uh, hangout, we'll go over different examples where uh, Minecraft has been used in STEM. Do you want me to continue, Chris? Oh, no, or... my, uh, my mute button was having fun with me. Oh. Uh, so I gotta <laughs> love when technology happens. Yes. Uh, so, <laughs> so we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll, ch we'll, we'll turn it over to uh, Lucas for a little bit. Lucas, can you talk a little bit about what you're doing in Minecraft in schools? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I work with the K-12 district uh, in southeastern North Carolina, a fairly, fairly rural area um, and, and a diverse uh, population of students and teachers and um, we started about, probably about two years ago, using Minecraft in our schools. We set up a server at the district level and started a program uh, in which uh, students at two different, elementary students at two different schools uh, were coming together at the same time and working together collaboratively to build some things. Um, and that was sort of our pilot program to see how things worked. It, it went um, amazingly well, uh, and the level of engagement and excitement was just off the charts completely. And so... Um, we began to expand it from there. Um, our, our school board did a, a mini grant program um, in which um, we opened up uh, the opportunity for teachers to apply to, to get a class set of accounts and then to be able to join that space and do um, projects and such in, in that virtual space as well. And, um, and it continues to grow from there. So we have a, a, a variety of different implementations. We actually run two servers now in our district. One server is primarily a creative server, um, and, and teachers, what I've found is teachers are mostly using that for specific building projects. For example, we have teachers who um, have students coming in, they do research on a particular North Carolina landmark historical structure point of interest or whatever. The students do their research, and they come in and they recreate to the best of their abilities within Minecraft, and then they'll give a tour of that area. Um, and we have teachers who are, um, last year we had a, one of our uh, high school um, ecology, AP, Earth Environmental Science teachers, uh, came in and, and did a section on um, ecology and looked at Minecraft as a model for um, how, what happens when you um, deforest an area and, or, and basically go from a, a, a sort of a, a natural area to a more urban area and look at how Minecraft models that impact and then talk about how that works in the in the real world and they actually students collected data much as uh, biologists would do the same thing in the real world by walking transects and counting and doing some uh, charts and graphs and such and um, and so that's one way that we're doing things and, and then on top of that <clears throat> uh, we're actually this year we, we've seen a real explosion uh, in just the, the interest in the number of students who are participating as we've opened up um, our primary what is our primarily our survival server 24/7 um, um, to students um, so they can access from home and we basically have a, a club that um, goes beyond the, the walls of any particular school in our district so we have students from uh, elementary all the way up to high school level all participating in this one community space and doing some really exciting things and so uh, they're, they're in there. I just checked a moment ago, and there's students in there right now building and working on projects together. So <laughs> nice. very, very exciting stuff that's going on with Minecraft. With the, with the carbon emissions, was that, was that similar to the uh, AMEE uh, Connect mod that they had created? I don't know if you've heard that about that one or not. Uh, where well, they've gone ahead, they've uh, worked on, on creating one on carbon emissions. Um, are you talking about in, in, our, um, in our implementation here? 
Yeah, I don't know how you implement it. Was that similar to... I'll put the link in the, the chat here. Yeah, share the link. No, uh, it wasn't... Um, I don't think we got into that. What what uh, This teacher came... And this teacher came up with this. Uh, this was mm-hmm. a, a teacher, Jessica Croson, and our media coordinator, Dan Rhodes, at that school, worked together. And um, what they did was they... Dan introduced it to Jessica and said, hey, you know, is this something your students might be interested in? Do? How can we make a connection between what you're already teaching, what your students need to learn, and this space where they can really have this immersive, engaging experience? And so what they came up with, they, they took an area, uh, and, and the students walked um, parallel lines across this area and did a count of all the flora and fauna that the Minecraft world had generated there. And then they went in and developed it and went back and did the same walk and did a comparison of those counts and looked at the effect of the development on that area. Yeah, no, the mod I was talk- I'm talking about is uh, they're interfacing it with uh, what happens if you burned uh, a shrubbery or something like that in Minecraft. It created you know carbon emissions, which led to global warming and all that other fun stuff. Uh, oh, so you had to plant cool. more trees. So, mm-hmm. so I put the link there. You can look it up later uh, and sh- feel free to share that. Uh, so, but that's the, immediately when I, when I when you're talking about it, that's what I thought about. I was like, okay, yeah, that's that's that sounds awesome. fun. So, um, and you've also done a couple other things in games as well. Um, yeah. So, uh, so would you want to talk about some of the other things you've been doing? <laughs> sure. Uh, <laughs> I got a lot. I'll, t- I'll take up all your time. I don't watch out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so um, as as a lot of people may know, um, uh, Steam and and Valve have have. Um, done at the program where it's uh, Teach with Portals. And so uh, teachers can get um, free licenses for their classroom for the game Portal 2. Um, and so we, we've uh, dabbled in that a little bit. We haven't gone real deep with it, but it has been made available to our, our, uh, our uh, teachers and our students. But what, basically what they're doing there is, um, one, they have access to the single player game, which is amazing. Uh, and, and just going through that and looking at it as a story and story elements in that. But also they have access to the level builder. And what's cool about the level builder is that students can come in and build their own levels for this first-person uh, style virtual game. And they can go in and take things like springboards and things like gravity and friction and things like that and begin to manipulate those variables for the different parts of that world and see how it impacts or how the computer game models um, how the impact of changing those variables and stuff. So um, really neat stuff there. We haven't gone real deep with that yet. Um, basically, just the students are, are designing levels, and we're really focusing on the, the design of levels and that sort of thing. But um, really exciting stuff that's going on with that. Um, and we've done a few other things uh, with some console gaming um, and um, and also uh, with a little bit of mathematics uh, gaming in the past. But but most of it has focused, and, and of course, World of Warcraft, uh, but most of that stuff has focused primarily on language arts sorts of activities. Very cool. So... Um, there's lots of stuff going on, and uh, I know with you, you always have different irons and a lot of different fires, so it reminds me of, of Kay, who is helping us out and hiding in the background. Uh, so I uh, probably want to talk a little bit about what, what I'm going to do. It's probably about time to talk about the, the hackathon event. What we're looking at is uh, right now we're in the process of planning for an event that's going to happen on April uh, 4th and 5th of uh, uh, 2014, and basically what we're looking at is uh, coming up with an event where we have computer programming students as well as some of our graphic design students, and uh, we're looking at developing a uh, hackathon that is Minecraft-themed. So um, so it's going to be kind of interesting to see. We're going to have people from, uh, as one person said, uh, at the last hackathon we did, they're like, well, it was interesting to see that, number one, people still do this. And where you can take people who have minimal idea about what, what coding is and add them with other coders, uh, people who have a, a, a little bit uh, greater understanding, and then a miracle happens. <laughs> and they learn how to code. Yeah. Surprise, surprise. Uh, so, so it'll be interesting to look at that. And, and, and that's one of the things we're looking at is, is how to improve, uh, you know, not only are we looking at traditional in the classroom teaching, but we're also looking at fully online teaching as well and seeing what, what best practices we can bring from the hackathon environment uh, where you have that live um, you know, interaction, intense interaction, and trying to figure out how we can also deliver that uh, online and virtually. So uh, one of the things we might have out there is, is I think that we may have, have to, to venture a little bit more into, into Minecraft in itself. So um, one of the questions we had um, was from the last session that was probably more relevant to this session is, is um, since we have uh, some specific people who are specifically STEM here, one of the questions posed was uh, looking at how could I use a game like Minecraft 
um, for some of my engineering students, and particularly some that have special needs um, and who are uh, uh, who are high functioning Asperger um, students. So um, I think if you, I don't know who wants to go first, uh, Lucas, you, I don't know if you have some experience with that, with dealing with some special needs kids as well, and uh, talk about how how you're seeing some of the games being used. Um, sure, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so we, we have had um, a variety of students participating in our programs ranging from um, you know all over uh, the, the different spectrums and labels and such. Um, it, one of the things though that I think is a common factor for, for most of the students who are participating is the engagement factor. And, and the cool thing about it is is that the games that we've used, uh, whether it's Minecraft, World of Warcraft, or whatever, um, they, they're very relevant to the students because they are commercially design games. They're not mm -hmm. games, they're not educational games per se or whatever. So um, the idea that of using them for instructional educational value is um, just as it's maybe surprising to, to some viewers out there, it, it's surprising to kids because uh, I think a lot of our students don't think about or make that connection that wait a minute, I, I can play this game that I really enjoy playing and I speak, sink all this time into and I can actually learn something valuable in it. And so um, what I've seen is that the students in these spaces, um, the, the virtual space frees them up in a lot of ways. One, we, we shed a lot of that um, social type stuff that comes along with sitting in a traditional classroom. Um, there, there's that, that whole thing about identity and avatar that comes into play. Um, and sometimes that's very empowering for certain students. Certain, mm -hmm. certain learners um, are really empowered by this idea that, you know what, I, I, I can be whomever I want to be in this space, and, and suddenly the playing field's leveled in a lot of ways. And that's, that, I see some neat things emerging because of that. Um, and let's see, other than that, um, like I said, the engagement piece is high. The, the, the way that these games approach failure, and then the way that they support this idea of community, um, if you foster that and you, and you really kind of um, you know, get in there and, and support that, that element of them, um, is also a very powerful thing as well. Because what I've seen, especially in, in, and as I was mentioning, we have that server that's running 24-7 now, is that a real sort of community of apprenticeship evolves out of that where newcomers who are fairly new to Minecraft mm -hmm. but they know they want to be in that space um, are often um, brought in and, and sort of taken under the wings of more um, expert players. And so I think regardless of the subject area, whether we're talking about STEM or, or other areas where we're starting to use these, these game worlds uh, and these game environments, um, that, that we, they really foster this sort of thing that sometimes our traditional classrooms just don't address as well. Thank you. Um, and another thing is, is uh, I know for uh, um, since you've been looking at the the uh, research side, can you talk a little bit more about the different science aspects you see um, from your area, sort of what you're seeing in in Minecraft? Um, yeah. Uh, well, uh, I just want to add uh, the uh, Lucas basically had good points. So mainly Minecraft and any other game basically used now in education. The biggest advantage is mainly promote this collaboration between students, and that's a plus that we don't see much in the classroom, and has been some of the the concern for parents as well as uh, uh, different uh, leaders in uh, education. And the plus that I see for Minecraft is more of this creativity from both sides, from the students, and it's amazing what they do in some schools. And at the meantime. Uh, um, the instructors uh, and what they come up with ideas to assign for students uh, to do. So we cannot talk about biology without talking about math. So to me, they go hand in hand. So uh, Micra has been used a lot in uh, in teaching math uh, as well, mainly because uh, it's a 3D virtual world and basically it's easy to link geometry to measurement and concept. So a lot of schools. Uh, uh, from K3 to high school, basically, they're using it to teach uh, the concept math and measurement and have students have this perception and also learn this perspective how to do the measurement uh, as well. Uh, in biology, precisely, it is used uh, as well. Uh, let's see, if I choose enzymatic reactions, uh, we know enzymes, they need substrates, which are nothing more than molecules they work upon, so they have to be complementary. Again, this 3D dimension of, uh, of the Minecraft. So the students are able to build their own kind of molecules. They can react, uh, they can do the reaction, and 
sometimes you can work out with other type of molecules and they can kind of visualize the inhibition and explain and process uh, this information. Uh, in Australia, again, they're using um, um, some of the assignments that they give the students, there are two different types of cells. So you have the bacteria and you have us, if, uh, if I have to simplify. So the student build their own cells and basically they study the difference between the two. So it's a good visual for the student to have this kind of compare contrast and they can elaborate more and more. What do you find in one versus another one? Uh, again, you have the comparison between the animal cells and uh, plant cells. Again, there's another study that was done uh, uh, on this and the students are enjoy, uh, enjoying it. Uh, the other um, the other new aspect right now, uh, we do have some some of them here in the US, but there are some um, camp, and usually they happen during the summer. So, so like here we have the ID Tech camp. I don't know if you heard of it, Chris, did you, or Lucas? No, I, I have not. Yeah, so it's a sort of program that teaches kind of uh, the fundamentals of STEM, and basically they're using video games as well from 7 to 18 years old, uh, basically, throughout the entire, uh, the ra the, uh, all the grades. And they're using uh, different types of games, and Minecraft is one of them, and kind of you are learning STEM through those, uh, through those uh, videos. Um, they have, they just come up with a new, um, uh, new program that they have and I think they're expanding even more and more so uh, I'll send you the information uh, later so they're working on this and the feedback from the students is amazing in terms of what they have learned and how they are applying um, the STEM uh, basically in general uh, the other thing again it's used in human biology uh, a lot so the student kind of create different types of cells. So if I choose the nervous system, so in Australia there is one high school teacher, he made the student make the nerve cells, and the chemicals that they produce are neurotransmitters, and basically the idea, depending on the quantity that they produce, what is the connection and how is the flow of the information is coming from one cell to another one. So again, you have this panic mode that has to be done quickly and you have all of those abnormalities that they can learn throughout this uh, process of studying how the nervous system uh, function. Uh, others do um, basically a survey of the different organs and basically what we have inside of the body and what is the function of each one of them. So it's amazing. What I like mo most about Minecraft is more of this three-dimensional view, which is almost similar, kind of close, I should say, to really looking at the organ rather than just a picture, which is kind of just a plain picture. So that's mainly the advantage from using uh, Minecraft. Um, in uh, ecology, again, and Lucas mentioned this, um, uh, all the biomes and the different ecosystem, a lot of science teachers are using. Uh, Minecraft for that. I just want to add whoever is working with uh, with those will be fun like basically the, what uh, the schools that Lucas was mentioning to compare the biodiversity and kind of create similar or different scenarios and see what happened. Is there increase? Is there decrease? And that's how they can basically talk about evolution and kind of speciation and all the advantage and the disadvantage depending on what happened. So I talk a lot, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that, that's fine. And uh, uh, actually, you know, we're gonna we're gonna have a, we actually have a question, uh, sort of talking about. Can we talk a little bit more about the basics of Minecraft? Someone who's new to Minecraft, saying, you know, how do you build that interactivity? And uh, um, specifically, some questions were about like redstone and the circuits that are there. And I think Lucas, I think you're set up to to sort of demonstrate some stuff or, or look at Minecraft. And sort of give give people a little bit of a uh, new tutorial. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and so, first off, let me let me just say that I'm in in no way a um, an expert on redstone. Hold on, I tried to share my screen here, but it is not letting me do that. Well, come on. Um. Oh well. Hangouts is not lit. It doesn't want to. Oh wait, there it is. It's just behind. <laughs> Moving windows around. Hold on just a second, and I'll have you some examples to look at. All right. Let's see. This computer's screaming for mercy right now. Okay, are you seeing my screen? Where is yes, it? Yes, we're seeing it. 
Okay. Okay. So, 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 great question. And, and so, um, one of the things that's really cool, and this really ties into sort of both the science and the engineering side of of Minecraft and what you can do with it. And and just in case you're not familiar with with this idea, because there's a lot of terminology. And ask your students about if you're a classroom teacher, ask your students about Minecraft and just watch. They'll they'll really start blowing you away with all this specialized terminology. And you're like, whoa, I don't even know what you're talking about. So, one of the things. Um, that exists in the world is this con is this uh, substance called redstone, and what redstone is um, is something you mine from the ground in in the world, and then you can use it to create basically what amounts to a wiring system in the game. Uh, but with those wires, you can create specialized circuits and, um, and create um, from there really take it and create machines that do all sorts of amazing things. So uh, if you go on YouTube. And, and look, do some searching on redstone creations. Um, just be prepared to be blown away. People have actually created completely functional computers, um, graphing calculators, all out of the blocks in Minecraft. Um, and, and they actually work, and it's pretty amazing. Now, that's way beyond what I'm, I've ever done or seen in the real world. But I can show you a couple of things um, that our learners are building. And this is completely voluntary. It has not been attached to any grade or anything like this. This isn't our... our, our uh, group kind of club server, and what we do uh, monthly is is host um, challenges, and so we'll, we'll call them uh, our our community events or challenges. So this is a particular community event um, which we called Redstonia, and and I had about the time that I put this event together <laughs> or this challenge, I was um, just beginning to explore this idea of redstone. Now, if if you are a Minecraft novice, and you you kind of got the basics down, but you want to learn more about redstone. Here's what I suggest: go on YouTube and find um, one of the YouTubers. Because by the way, Minecraft drives like a huge portion of YouTube traffic right now, and so you shouldn't have a hard time finding anything. But but find Minecrafters out there like Mumbo Jumbo or some of these other people who have channels, and they'll walk you through step by step how to do things with redstone. And in the process, you start to begin to uh, develop an understanding about how it works. So that's kind of what I did with this challenge. Um, I knew some of our students knew how to do things with Redstone, could make some neat things with Redstone, but some of them wanted to learn. And so we put out a challenge for um, our learners, and this was our November event, was the uh, Redstone challenge. And what they had to do was choose a, a plot in this flat world um, that um, I set up for them. And um, we said, okay, create a Redstone uh, something that uses redstone, and we gave them some parameters, but really didn't give them specifics other than that. Just said it has to use redstone. Um, it needs to do, you know, such, some little basic kind of thing. Um, and then if you can incorporate um, a chicken into it somehow, you got a bonus point. Um, and it, just to throw it in for fun. So, <laughs> well, you get biology there. So well, you know. yeah, that's true. Yeah. And, the, and since it was November, the chicken, we said, we'll pretend it's a turkey. Since Minecraft uh, doesn't have turkeys in it, we'll say, well, these are turkeys, and this is a Thanksgiving event. Um, and so we have um, things like, like this is one of our, our players. This is a, um, a middle school girl um, here in our district who built this. And, and basically it's from a tutorial, but it's a completely functional um, elevator and it's all powered nice. by a system of um, redstone that passes off the signal once a player steps into it and um, presses a certain button um, that, that will move them up uh, the system and um, from level to level to level by using a system of uh, pistons and passing that signal, that circuit or that sort of burst of energy along from one to the next. Um, we have some other things here, and I, and I haven't actually even been out here to, to see everything that they've created, so it's all over the place. Um, but here's a series of dispensers it's like that are... like your own little skunk works there. Oh, it, it's, it's yeah. incredible. <laughs> and, and you know, it, it's, it's kind of funny, because you mentioned... One of the things I have found is that if you just simply give them the space, they'll do something with it, um, and give them the space and just one little seed of, like, See if you can do this, and and it, and this is what happens. And so this is all the result of, of stuff that they built in November, and these are all different. Um, I I haven't actually checked on this. I think it looks like an air hockey table to me, but I'm not exactly sure. Um, so it, it's just amazing, and um and even you know I invited them. Hey, come out and and create a space where you just experiment with redstone to kind of learn how it works, and so there's, these are some examples, and my graphics are glitching a little bit, let me get down to the ground here, um, and, and this is what they were doing here, they were playing with repeaters and circuits and, um, and testing those out to see how they worked, and um, just gave them a space to do that, and so we have 
uh, you know, a variety of things out there, you know, automatic sugarcane farms, which seems to be leaking right now, um, and um, dispensers like vending machines. And, and then when I told them also, one of the parts of the challenge was is to make it a teaching event, so to help teach their fellow Minecrafters. So take parts of it and be sure to label it and explain how it works. So um, here we're talking about how um, using a dropper connected to um, a hopper and putting one object in there creates this infinite loop which will generate a signal uh, that's on a timer kind of thing and it will pass that back and forth um, that will generate a certain uh, you know, function in the world. So um, really interesting though to see how they've embraced that and what they've learned and now how that stuff, the stuff that we're seeing here is spilling over into the, the main world where they're building their castles and their houses and stuff now are starting to incorporate certain parts of this, this redstone stuff. So they have automatic doors now and traps and things like that. Well, exactly. And like that's the interesting thing about Minecraft is the, the introduction of redstone because it really is sort of that, you know, that Higgs boson particle. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it makes everything happen. You know, it's, it's, you know, they can use it for crafting. They can use it for brewing. They can use it for uh, a lot of different things. And it's sort of what, what gives their, their mechanisms and their clockworks Life and so I mean that's really one of the interesting things about it is that you know people are it's it, like I said it's it, you know as you said it's, people are still finding different ways to use it and, and play around with it as well. Yeah, so. it, it's absolutely it's it's so fascinating, um, like what what can be done with it. Um, so yeah, just hit YouTube and start doing some searches on um, on the redstone yeah. stuff and and it's just it's amazing what people are making with it. And it is, and it actually, you know, that echoes a lot of what we, we heard in the first session was that, you know, all of them were just saying, go to YouTube. Everyone's saying, go to YouTube. Yeah. You know, if you, if you want to learn something, go to YouTube. And Absolutely. so it's, and so, but yet we still have them go look at books. But anyways, uh, so. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> We're slow. We're a little slow. Because you teach, yeah. Because you teach, that's why. Well, it was, it was fun. Whenever I whenever I worked as a small business de development director, I actually had to refer someone to a book about YouTube to get them to go to YouTube. So it was kind of interesting. <laughs> um, so uh, they didn't want to get a website. Uh, but but learning changes. So uh, one of the things I want to do is I want to um, I've actually crowd an, another speaker who's uh, not on our list. I'm going to bring in Kay, uh, who is the chair of uh, SIGVE. And uh, she's going to talk a little bit about the computational learning and, and, and some of the connections that she, she sees. She's uh, sort of been typing at me furiously, so I said, fine, come on in. Uh, so, so we'll go ahead and uh, we'll bring her in to talk about uh, uh, the, the computational learning aspect from uh, ISTE as well as uh, where she sees that connection. Well, actually, actually, the reason I, I was getting real excited by listening to all of this, OK? And, and the reason why is because with um, our special interest group for virtual environments, we are really looking at opera uh, <laughs> at computational thinking. And I pulled the and I pulled this up here. And uh, for anybody who, who needs to see it. And I hopefully this will come up. We'll see uh, at the screen in a moment if it is showing well. Yes. Because this is a good looking one. <laughs> the other one is kind of but basically computational thinking problem-solving process that includes the following characteristics. Formulating problems, logically organizing and analyzing data, representing data through abstracts, models, simulations, automated solutions, and I mean, so on and so on. <laughs> but the deal of it is, when I hear Minecraft, uh, I'm an instructional designer, I could totally map everything you're talking about back straight to computational thinking, yeah. right here. I could I could map it back with absolutely no problem, and this and especially when they start talking skills supported and enhanced, confidence in dealing with complexity, persistence in working with difficult problems, tolerance for ambiguity, all of these things it so hits on what we heard from Morrowcraft and also what the what the two of you are thinking about, and and I think that's what we need to start doing with virtual worlds and games. We need to pull out the computational thinking, <laughs> show, yeah. show it to any of the naysayers. <laughs> I hate to say it, go to Common Core, pull out the math, stats, and probability portion of it, and go, yeah. you see what they're doing? Look there. Got it? You know? And if we have to yeah. make YouTube videos, machinima out of it to prove it, then, then I say that's where we go. 
Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, and and just like you're talking about here, one of the cool things about um, what I'm seeing in our students are those very things. Um, and and they don't they don't realize it, that they're de developing these skills, and that's fine with me that there's not this formal like I have to learn this and I have to show this it's just happening in this space because these students are coming in they're even the ones that are taking YouTube tutorials and they're saying okay I want to build step by step what this other guy has built in um, with redstone and they'll come in and they'll do it and then suddenly it's not working right you know and, and a piston goes to get stuck in the own position or, mm -hmm. or you know yeah. a, a something's mm -hmm. not working they're like I don't understand, and so then that, that starts developing that idea of problem solving and troubleshooting, which I think is we don't give students enough opportunities traditionally to troubleshoot, to fail in a safe space, and that's one of the great things about Minecraft is it gives us a safe place. I can go in and screw things up all day. If it doesn't work, I'll just erase <laughs> it all and start over. It doesn't matter. See, see, what I love is whenever the students follow, like, like the students expect it, so they like follow you around with dirt in their hands because they know you're gonna punch a hole <laughs> in the oh, ground. Yeah. You're gonna remove something. Uh, uh, you know, I've have seen uh, you know I've seen very you know fourth graders who have extreme amount of patience for adults who keep punching out the switch instead of open to open the door, and it's like right click versus left click. Uh, so I mean that's one of the nice things about it. So. Um, okay, we'll go ahead. Kay has a comment. Oh, I was going to just say that only happened one time, and I learned to put my sword in my hand, and things are okay now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Some people are like, going, why does everyone have swords in their hand? It's so they don't break anything. You know? <laughs> Kay, if you look at the skills, if you upload back uh, the slide that you had for the CT uh, skills and all the fun stuff that we're looking at, Yep, it's back. Yeah, okay, okay, I can see it. Um, the United Nations Habitat, have you heard of it? So there is a United Nations Habitat, it's, it's a collaboration between a lot of uh, uh, basically uh, districts and schools from different places. And basically it's called Block by Block. And it's again based on Minecraft and basically this allows students uh, kind of from all over the world to modify their own neighborhood and create the changes that they would like to see. So at the meantime you have this collaboration going on but and it also solving problem ambiguity like okay me and Lucas were saying what the way how we're seeing things may be different than the way how you and Luke will be seeing it. You have all of those combined, so that will be something you can bring to the committee uh, as well. Uh, and I will send you the information about it. Yeah, you have it. Okay, I'm trying to pull it up. <laughs> yeah, United Nations Habitat called Block by Block. Yeah. I thought I had it, but I'll go back and look for it. I just want to add one one more thing that I just remember. Uh, back to the first question, Chris, you, uh, you asked me. Um, Minecraft, of course, it is used in biology, in in biology as well as in chemistry. And there is the, it's it's a free, it's a uh, the mine chem, and which is a free mod uh, that they can use, and the student can go and explore uh, the 92 elements. So it's always kind of. A plus to use it before talking about biology. So we like students to have a little bit of knowledge in chemistry before talking about biology. <laughs> okay. Um, one of the things is, is I guess we we uh, I'm looking through for questions, and uh, so feel free to post questions. We'll go ahead and ask questions. Um, but one thing that we sort of want to talk about is, um, you know, what are you guys seeing as far as the the community? One of the interesting things I've seen. Um, with, with you know, definitely from the Minecraft presentation as well as the the Hackathon run is that it seems that the students are yeah you know, once you start giving the students that freedom uh, to make the mistakes to to explore and to uh, you know not necessarily you know in in uh, Marianne's idea of, of free range teaching but the idea of going ahead and saying you know how do you set up an environment where the students do have that that time. To allocate that, um, you know, how do you manage that? Uh, you know, you know, you know. For all you can talk a little bit about what you're doing as far as develop, how do you develop that community for your project outbreak? And, and Lucas, if you could talk a little bit about how you've how you formed community and some of the projects that that you've worked on. So we'll start off with Farah. 
Uh, well, uh, for the first case, we divide students into uh, groups, so we assign them the same uh, the same group. And the idea is kind of okay. Um, just to have this thought process, how they will come up with, uh, we'll ask them, okay, give us a list of questions. This is just a video, and basically we give them basic information, uh, plugged in a lot of jargon, new for them in microbiology, and the idea, okay, well, and then they keep asking me, okay, uh, what this means. Now, just to give you an idea, we take them next to the library, so they can just turn, go to the library, and have all of those answers. They have their iPad and iPhone with them, so they can even Google the word and find out the definition. So it takes a little bit of time for them to kind of make this connection and mm. kind of use the digital information uh, right away. And uh, later, for the following cases, uh, we give each one of them a different, uh, each group a different uh, case scenario, different countries. And it's more of this building. and. Um, I will say from all the students that I have been basically working with, depending on the group, again, some of them enjoy this team building uh, going on, and then most of the time the frustration that I hear, well, uh, when I called XY, we could not meet, so I have no idea if the way I was kind of analyzing the information is in the same way how the other person. So what I did, uh, we're using uh, the discussion board as a kind of the virtual meeting time for them and they can go there and then post questions and help uh, each other. The feedback that I got from the student is more of the idea of, okay, now they're the one who should go and look for this information rather than just me giving uh, them. And uh, the fun part is sometimes, well, in microbiology, sometimes the infections are almost similar. Like flu-like symptoms, you can go over 60 different diseases, and all of them would have flu-like symptoms. <laughs> so the key part is kind of trying to narrow it down, and usually you come <laughs> down to one or two mm -hmm. for that. And because, again, there's point tied to it. So they always, they, usually the week before you know, um, the final day where they have to turn in uh, the papers, like, we think this is what we, it is. Could you double check because we don't want to lose all of those points? <laughs> and usually they're close if at some, most of the time uh, they nailed it. Uh, so they seem to enjoy it because they're learning and they're kind of working together. Uh, it's a plus because, let's be honest, there's no class that we had that teach, okay, this is team building. And then, yes, we end up having a degree and going to work somewhere. So I think it's a plus that they're doing it right now. And the advantage, I teach also the lab. So they are do kind of having this collaboration both in the lab as well as in this project outside of my lecture time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lucas? Yeah, so kind of to echo some of the things that Farah said, um, one of the things that, that we've done for our 24-7 um, club server that's going on that, that, uh, to build community is to actually create a space that exists outside of Minecraft and outside of the classroom for them. So we're actually using Edmodo for that. So we set up an Edmodo group for them, and those students come in there. That's sort of a place, a sort of a, a common ground uh, where I can go in and say, hey, guys, the uh, server's going to be down today. I'm updating or... Uh, hey, there's a new challenge, um, and get involved in that. And they can have some, some sort of discussion about some of the things that are going on. And the other thing that I'm really working to do, one, just for my own sanity, for all the different things that I've got going on, is to try to pass off um, the, the ownership of the server to the students and actually let them take some, some charge of it. So we established, and I'm kind of experimenting with this, and it's a work in progress, but established a ranking system in there and, and the, so all students start out at a certain rank and they participate in certain kinds of activities and they have the option of ranking up. And as they rank up, they get access to certain little perks and things that they can do on the server that they weren't able to do before necessarily. And the, way, the kinds of activities that I have them doing um, are actually community building sorts of activities. So um, one is just participating in a community event and, and then achieving a certain level in this sort of um, MMO style plugin that we have going on. But then beyond that, um, they have to invest more time and, um, and then actually start contributing ideas for server community events or creating tutorials either um, in some whatever presentation format they choose or as a YouTube video or whatever and sharing that back to the community. Again, the idea is to support the, the community and build, bring the newcomers along 
with them. Um, and so as those ranks go up, the level of commitment and investing back into the community that goes on ranks up as, and scales up as well. Um, so it's a big experiment. Um, and as far as tying it back to um, sort of the curricular science sort of thing, um, the challenge, what, what I'm seeing is the challenge is, is that um, the school setting often, one of the things that I find is so limiting is, is this idea that we have a limited amount of time. Um, and this idea of seat mm -hmm. time is just a killer. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, and, and because we got students coming into this that have a variety of different experiences with just the technical side of it. I mean, I have students who the idea of using W, A, S, and D in a mouse to move around and operate in a three-dimensional space is completely new to them. And so mm -hmm. it will take them two or three sessions, uh, and they only get maybe 50 minutes gotcha. a week yeah. um, to acclimate to that. And what I see, what I'm seeing is, I'm seeing neat things going on there, and 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 the classroom setting with its use. But I'm seeing the really compelling stuff that I'm seeing. Uh, I'm I'm leaning more toward this idea of free range education um, because <laughs> that's what I, I agree. Think. I agree. Yes, yes. Yeah. stuff is happening there. And so what I do is I this 24/7 access is there. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just throw something out. It's not even tied to a grade. I don't care if you get halfway through it and you don't finish it or whatever, but just by giving them that and know it, they know they have that freedom, and they know they have the community and the time, um, and, say, and, and then not giving them a, a completely defined problem. One of the things that we do and that we, we I, I think we really fail at in science education is mm -hmm. we do a scenario where we say, here's a lab. And in this yeah. lab, here are your materials, and you're going to do this, you're going to do step this, by step do by this step. and you should see this. Well, <laughs> thank you. This nice sheet of paper tells me exactly what I'm going to experience. And, and so what I'm finding is that with these challenges um, that, I'm, that I'm creating, that the students mm -hmm. are creating, is that they're ill-defined. It's just like, here's a problem. This yeah. is, these are some minimal criteria, but I'm not telling you anything else. You go do it. Do something awesome. And, and that freedom... Uh, with that freedom and the time that they have, and, and that you know, they can go in and work on it when they can, I'm getting, I'm, I'm seeing amazing things happen. Now, how do you marry that to um, the idea of a 90 day or 180 day here in North Carolina, 185 day, um, you know, length of time for instruction and, and mm -hmm. that kind of thing? I, I don't know. I'm still working through that, but there, there's got to be some happy medium there. Well, I think that's a really key point, and and we're sort of going to wrap up here real quick. But one of the, the key points there is that you're still working through it. Uh, you know, the instructor is still working. I mean, that's that's a very important thing is that the instructor has to provide the context. The instructor has to know the game well enough to get the students started. I think that's that's one of the key things uh, you know, I'm hearing in, in, in everyone's discussion today is, is saying, okay, well, we're getting people started, and we're trying, we need to have that core group of people who not only, you know, that you have, to, that the instructor sort of has to know their curriculum well enough to sort of look at the learning objectives and tie that back. But you also have to be able to, to um, take a step back and let the students take charge. Like, No Clue does a wonderful job of stepping back and going, okay, help me do this or tell me how I should do this. And uh, she may know how to do it. She she probably does. Uh, she likes to be be sneaky like that. And, and she and so she asks the students, well, how do you think I should do this? And that gives the idea gives them uh, a lot of that uh, focus. The other thing that's out there we we really didn't get into a lot was uh, mods. And that's really <laughs> sort of where where a lot of the sciences, a lot of the STEM area is is probably going to be turning to. Um, because the game itself has some features, but really where people are doing a lot of different things mm -hmm. is in the, the arena of mods. And, and that's going to be the interesting thing that we're going to look at because uh, for my project is that a lot of the students are, uh, are already without any prompting saying, we wanted, to do, we wanted to do something about games. We want to do something with games. And so um, the Minecraft modding gives them a way to marry the two areas that I'm looking at. Because what I'm looking at is how do I improve computer science and how do I give them that actual? Because because what we're finding is is the students learn how to how to create an array. They learn how to create a loop. They learn how to write a, a chunk of code, but they don't get that experience of actually creating a full program, and in, inside a semester. And so uh, what we're finding is 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 using the hackathon. That's one of the lessons learned we have is that students want to complete something. Um, they don't care if it works. They just want to make sure that it, they can complete it. So that way they can say, hey, look, here's something we've completed. And also you spin it around from the industry side, because I'm in career tech, and the industry side says, we want demonstration of mastery. We want to see that your student knows how to create a web page. That they know that they didn't just get mm -hmm. grades, but they actually went ahead and they actually created a, an object in a, in a portfolio. 
And so what I'll do is I'll give both of you guys uh, your quick, I'll give you guys a quick pitch uh, for, for why Minecraft and, and, and STEM. So we'll give you, I'll just talk a little bit here, just sort of occupy some mic space to give you guys some time to think about that. Okay, go for a. It's, uh, well, it's a 3D, that's the beauty about it. And um, I, I would be focusing more on biology in my answer here. So we're more visual, so we like to see things. <laughs> So it's a plus, it's an advantage. Now, uh, it is across this, the whole uh, realm of discipline uh, in, in the STEM because I see it more as a good tool to be used for an inquiry-based learning uh, uh, approach for the students. You have the collaborative aspect uh, for that, um, uh, that that we talk uh, about. And we're kind of back to what we were talking about in terms of they have to learn how to code or at least use computer. Uh, soon right now they're learning in different way how we have learned so we have to provide them with the tool needed uh, this way they can apply them to uh, later in life uh, so it, it, it's a plus and the advantage is using Minecraft is the best way or one of the best ways I should say in applying and learning uh, the critical thinking skills and I think that's that's an advantage and of course they will need it later for life thank you Thank you for that, Lucas. Yeah, so I think one of the key things that that Minecraft gives us the opportunity to do is modeling, and um, yep. and and that's so important in all the STEM curricula. It's this idea of modeling things, whether it's a mathematical concept or an engineering or math uh, science concept or whatever. And and the thing is, is that a lot of people will look at this and say, well, Minecraft is so limited. The the graphics are limited. You're talking about squares and blocks and cubes and all that. But the beauty of that is that the limitation itself actually becomes a strength because we're I dealing agree, with yeah. a situation where a, an environment that has certain limitations and so we can try to create a model within that environment and and in the process I think that taps into some really higher order thinking skills like within this limitation how can I demonstrate a certain concept and then to reach those really higher levels of thinking we can say okay now let's take what we know about the real world in this concept or scenario where does this model break down and and that's a really cool thing and, but, but again, and like Farah says, it's that visual, that three-dimensional spatial aspect of it. Um, and it's a really low barrier to entry. It's, a, it's inexpensive mm -hmm. compared to other software. And it's, um, it's easy to pick up um, and, and get started in. So yeah, it's definitely a win-win. All right. Well, thank you. I just you. want to add oh. one thing, please. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the 21st century skills, the student need one of, I mean, the first one that you have is basically they have to have some knowledge in the digital world, and I believe this is the best way how we can use it to kind of convey this information to them. We're not doing any service if we teach the student kind of the board and the, yes, yeah, smart board, but then again, we need to add something <laughs> plus to it. I appreciate <laughs> having me. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I think that's that's the thing. I mean, really, what I like about um, you know using games in my curriculum and encouraging my instructors to do that is really looking at finding that epistemic frame, finding that community of practice, creating that environment that allows the students to experiment and be uh, f uh, free to fail to a certain extent, and allow them to to explore and really sort of find out what they want to do. So. Uh, with that, I want to thank everyone for the wonderful discussion. I, I wish we had a lot thank more you. time because uh, you guys are awesome. And it's been a lot of fun. Our next session coming up is the Minecraft and Machinima. Uh, so for those of you watching, uh, go ahead, take a quick break, refreshing your drinks, and uh, we'll be back with some more. Thank you for Th watching. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you, guys. Thank you,